What's going on sixpackabs.com? It's Thomas DeLauer, creator of the science-based six-pack and your fasting expert. But today, I'm talking about proteins in general. I'm talking about the myths behind certain proteins and how your body truly breaks them down and some of the things that you might have heard about given protein sources and why or why not they may or may not be true. And if you haven't already, check out my science-based six-pack program that you can see below in the description. But let's get to it. All right, so by now you know that Thomas DeLauer is not too big on having copious amounts of protein. I'm big on doing the most with the least. I've done videos talking about the amount that you should actually have. And we've concluded that 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight is perfectly sufficient when it comes down to having enough protein to build muscle and ultimately stay in shape. But in this video, I do wanna talk about meat sources in general, because a lot of times people think that one meat source is unhealthier or better than the other. Let me first start off this entire video by saying this. Meat is hard to break down. It's hard on the body in the first place and you don't require a lot to begin with. The only true difference between different kinds of protein aside from the amino acid structures that you're going to find is going to be the difference between organic meats, non-organic meats, ethically raised and hormone-free animals versus non-ethically raised and hormone-enriched animals, okay? But today I wanna to talk about red meat and some of the myths that come behind it because one protein is not necessarily worse than the other. The first thing I wanna talk about is people tend to think that red meat above all other meats is hard on the body when it comes to cancer. The fact is a 2004 study done by Harvard University that took a look at 725,000 people found that there was no correlation between red meat and cancer. And especially there wasn't an increase in the rate of cancer with red meat consumption versus other meat consumption. The fact of the matter is, the carbon footprint on your body is about the same no matter which route that you go. But where does the cancer myth sort of come from? It comes from something known as heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is a direct result of how we cook any meat, not just red meat. Generally speaking, we're grilling red meat, so the association with red meat and HCAs is a lot higher but if we're grilling different kinds of meat, we're still going to have the same instance of HCAs. You see, what these HCAs are, they are a reaction between the aminos, the proteins, and of course the creatine that is actually in meats. And when it reacts at a high temperature, it creates these heterocyclic amines that cause a mutagenic response within the body. They cause our DNA to change, which can cause us to grow a cancer cell. They are very carcinogenic, but this is gonna come if you cook any meat, not just red meat, at a super high temperature. And then the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are aromatic. They're a result of the fat dripping off the meat onto the grill and causing an issue there. So the cancer issues with meat don't necessarily come from the meat themselves. They come from how we cook it and quite honestly, the overconsumption of different things in general, whether it's meat or not. The next one I wanna talk about is digestion. Meat in general is more difficult to break down, it requires more enzymes, requires more of the bacteria to actually break down, and it's just flat out more mechanically difficult to actually chew and break down. But red meat structure isn't much different from any other meat structure as far as what's going on with pancreatic lipase and the actual enzymatic activity within the body. What does happen though, is if you're not eating a particular source of food for an extended period of time, you start losing the ability to break it down as easily. And since we generally consume a lot more white meat than we do red meat, you'll find that a lot of times people are more sensitive to red meat because they lack some of the enzymes or they have less of the enzymes to break down red meat than to break down white meat or fish, for instance. Next up is the effect of protein and inflammation. Okay, it has to do with something known as NEU5GC. Now, it's been said that red meat contains a lot more NEU5GC than other meats. Well, that's not the case. NEU5GC is in all animal proteins with the exception of human proteins. Now, I'm gonna to get to making some sense of this in just a second, so hear me out. Okay, thousands of years ago, humans contained NEU5GC. We contained this certain type of molecule that would have a reaction with certain foods that we would eat, to make a very long story short. Over time, we've had our own mutation to where we do not have this NEU5GC anymore, but we may still have some antibodies to it floating around, which means when we do consume animal proteins, we have a reaction with the antibodies and the NEU5GC from those animal proteins. But what is inconclusive is what is really happening in the body when that occurs. And the interesting thing is that red meat contains less NEU5GC than a lot of other meats. So when people say that red meat is more inflammatory than other meats, they're completely confused because it doesn't really make a difference. We don't even know for a certain fact 
if this NEU 5GC actually does play a role in inflammation. And for those of you that are wondering what inflammation is, it's the body's immune response to things. It's the body's ability to fight off an infection or whatever's going on in the body that may be bad or to fight off a foreign body. So if we have antibodies to something, and then that foreign body comes in, those antibodies attack it, we have an increase in inflammation. But we have to realize that protein in general is inflammatory because inflammation in and of itself is a series of rogue proteins that are running rampant throughout the body. So it's kind of a diluted argument. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now the next one that I want to talk about does make sense, but we have to understand exactly how it works. It's called arachidonic acid. And if you were to search Google for arachidonic acid, you would end up finding a lot of things saying that red meat is really the culprit. Arachidonic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid. This omega-6 fatty acid isn't just in meats, it's in plants too. And arachidonic acid is a very unique kind of omega-6 that contributes to building the cell membrane, but it also supports the immune system and plays a part in inflammation. It's not that it's bad, it's only bad when there is too much and when the ratio to omega-6 and omega-3 is off. You see, polyunsaturated fatty acids are generally speaking going to be omega-6s. Most meat sources have high levels of other omega-6s in addition to arachidonic acid, meaning the overall amount of omega-6 in most meat sources is extremely high compared to the omega-3 content. If you have omega-6s here and omega-3s here, you're going to have inflammation, whether it's arachidonic acid or not. If you have omega-6s here and omega-3s here, then you're balanced and you're in a good place. If you have omega-3s here and omega-6s here, you're in a really good place. It doesn't matter if that omega-6 is arachidonic or not. All that's going to matter right now is that ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. And since red meat actually contains less other polyunsaturated fatty acids, the overall collective omega-6 count is quite a bit lower than other meat sources. So as far as the omega-3, omega-6 ratio inflammation argument goes, other meat sources other than red meat are usually worse for your body. So I hope that this clears up some of the confusion. I'm not condoning one or the other. I just get tired of people picking one particular meat source and saying it's worse than the others. The fact is we need to be consuming less of it. We need to be focusing more on timing, eating less, like with fasting, and focusing on what we eat and when we eat at the end of the fasting window. So as always, keep it locked in here with Six Pack Abs, and I will see you in the next video.